Well, Mary Poppins, would you believe it? The anabolic baby is back and he's even landed himself a big fight on one of the most stacked cards in boxing history. But... I suppose we have to ask the big questions, don't we? Who is this double controversial man? Why is he known as one of, if not the worst drug cheat in the sport? And should he even be allowed back in the ring? Actually, I'll answer that one for you now quickly. abso fucking lootly not. But anyway, let's get cracking. Let's take a plunge into this fiasco. Strap on in. So then, yes, old Ped Sheeran made an unexpected return to the ring in June 2022 and decided to get moving double lively. He fought Bracamonte and Cardenas within four weeks of each other, winning on points and then by knockout. Now, in his last fight against Bogdan Dinu four years previous, Big Baby came in at a whopping 315 pounds. Yes, that's around 22 and a half stone, sweet child of mine, which is pretty big, isn't it? But for his comeback, he thought, ah, oh, I can do better than that. Give me that tin of quality street. He popped down Greg's two for one on sausage rolls. Ah, oh, give us. 150 of them, fuck it, and chuck in a gingerbread bloke as well for dessert, bosh. And yes, he managed to come in at a whopping £26 heavier at £341. Bloody hell. The extra baggage, of course, was apparent. He was a lot slower than before and very gassy at the end of the Bracamonte fight. So he trimmed down a whopping £8 for his next bout. A tougher test against the also controversial Lucas Brown. And as you can see, it was an incredible transformation. Slimmer of the month. But regardless, he got the job done in style. Unfazed by Brown's power, constantly coming forward in true baby style to finish off the job in the sixth round. He was still unbeaten now with a mega 26 wins on his record, a record that if you never knew the backstory would suggest he deserves a big fight. And lo and behold, the time finally came. When out of the blue he gets a call from the double excellent turkey for a cheeky barnstormer against Daniel Dubious on the Saudi mega card. The anabolic baby was about to get his moment to shine on the biggest stage possible. But, well as we mentioned, does he deserve to be here? Well let's rewind a little bit shall we, so we can answer that question. All the way back to, oh there he is, bloody hell. I thought we'd never see him again Cougs. Now he's eating kangaroo cock on primetime fucking TV. Ah fair play to the bomber anyway. So we all know about the disastrous fallout of the AJ Miller fight back in 2019, but it actually all started long before that, back in his kickboxing days. He'd been on the boxing circuit for around five years by this time, but he topped up his income competing in glory kickboxing events and in 2014 he was suspended by the California State Athletic Commission after testing positive for banned substance mephloxylephlimlimlin or DMAA as it's also known, the same drug that Dillian White was banned for back in 2012. To be fair, this drug was on the shelves and legal not too long prior to this, but was banned soon after when some unfortunate deaths occurred. Miller wasn't too phased though, and decided to put all his energy into boxing instead. And it turned out to be a good move, leading to a stunning 13 stoppages in 16 fights from 2014, all the way up to the scheduled fight with Joshua. Okay, I know what you're thinking, I bet there was wasn't VADA testing for any of them fights, and he was probably on the old saucy stuff when he was knocking out people left, right and centre, and yes, you're probably right on both points, because in those years he certainly had a ruddy good engine on him, even whilst weighing near enough 300 pounds and looking like Sherman fucking clump. But yes, in the AJ build-up, he finally was rumbled, failing multiple tests for a staggering three different banned substances. Very cheeky. So let me sum up what they do as simply as possible, and all you gym goers, feel free to slate me in the comments and explain it a lot better. Bosh. To be fair, gym's not really my thing. I went once, but yeah, fuck all that. Them weights are well heavy. Give me the pub any day. Anyway, so GW501516. Yes, this was the first one. This basically changes the body's metabolism to burn fat for energy instead of muscle or carbs. But how does this help in boxing, you may ask? Well, it increases your endurance, reduces fatigue, giving you the energy to train for longer. Or more importantly, the energy to endure those grueling later rounds in the ring very useful. Then there was HGH, which ultimately promotes muscle building, improves strength and endurance, all the things that a heavyweight boxer will need when fighting another absolute unit in front of him. But the difference between this and the GW50, all them fucking numbers drug, is that this one can be injected, which is also the way to take the third banned substance that he failed on called EPO, also known as blood doping. This saucy drug increases your red blood cell mass, allowing the body to transport more oxygen to muscles, increasing 
stamina. Unlike anabolic steroids, it also disappears from the body quickly, which is quite useful when you know you're going to be tested, as you can imagine. Famously, cyclist Lance Armstrong disgraced his incredible career by failing on HGH and EPO also, and since he was one of the fittest and most resilient athletes in history, you can see how this combination would help the big baby to be a force in the ring. And all three together basically turned him into one of the fucking X-Men. Now, of course, he never came quietly. He gave it the usual, oh, no, you're joking, and yeah, I wouldn't do that. My body's a temple, bruv. I ain't even had a fucking paracetamol, all that spiel. And in the end, he blamed it all on a stem cell shot for his injured elbow. Yeah. Now, unless those stem cells belong to Arnold fucking Schwarzenegger, I reckon that's a big juicy load of baholics, bruv. And yeah, since injection is the most common means for these two substances, it makes it hard to believe the well-known excuse, oh yeah, it was an accident. Now, there are many side effects of these drugs, but we don't need to get into that now. However, as we know, one big side effect of some PEDs is male breast growth. And, uh, well, yeah, I'm not making any accusations, but, uh, yeah, check out these bad boys. Frank's having a good look, ain't he? He's thinking, fucking hell, size of them. Here, Turkey, have a look at these, bruv. It's like brasses over here. Fucking hell. Anyway, so the baby lost out on what could have tallied up to be a seven or eight million dollar payday. And if he'd have won, who knows how much he'd have made in the rematch. Regardless, though, he was denied a license pretty much everywhere. He received a soft six month ban and was out of action until his return in 2020. But he then inked a deal with Top Rank for his comeback fight. Jerry Forrest was the opponent, a brilliant comeback back to return himself to the top of the heavyweight division. It was time to make amends, time to start afresh. Yes, good on him, I say. Here we go. And oh, no. Bloody stem cells again. Oh, that elbow ain't half caused the baby some problems, ain't it? So then this time it was once again the GW50. Yeah, the loads of numbers one. But just like before, he weren't admitting to anything. No, not a sausage. And a few months later, he claimed to have found the source of the problem, stating it came from a sex pill he took a month before the test. The Black Ant King sex pill baby, which is basically Viagra. Oh, yes. But yeah, again, it's just not believable. Believable, is it? Since he's failed before, this excuse is just another hard on to believe. All right, sorry, no more puns. But you know what I mean? I, I just don't think it'll stand up in court, bosh. Anyway, he did actually get his lawyers working with the sex pill story, but basically the boxing world just said, yeah, all right, mate, fuck off. Old Bob Aaron was double fuming and dropped Millet immediately, and he was given a two-year ban by the Nevada State Commission, but also forced to enroll in Nevada random testing during his suspension, with the promise of being allowed back in the ring should he pass all tests, which in the end... He did. And the 23rd of June 2022, he was able to resume his career. And here we are. Now, the Bracamonte and Cardenas fights were small hall shows, so I don't know if there were any sort of testing for these. Maybe there were, maybe there weren't. The same for the Brown fights, enlighten me if there was. But ultimately, there certainly seems to be a more human big baby of late, as he was absolutely shattered after six rounds against Lucas Brown. And if we compare this energy in the final rounds of a 12 round fight against Duhapas, when he was most likely on the naughty stuff, there's a big difference. So with the VADA testing that is guaranteed to be in place for the Dubois fight, we may finally see what the big baby is really all about. We know he can bang, but is he genuinely that resilient and forceful? We shall see. But yes, it is simply incomprehensible that this man is allowed back in the ring after failing multiple tests with four different substances across two combat sports, three of which were in boxing. I'll give it to him, he is ruddy entertaining, but with his obvious intentions to gain an advantage in a sport that has such dangerous consequences, he should have been completely kicked out a long time ago. It's a sorry state of affairs, unfortunately. Anyway, roll on the 23rd. I'm buzzing for the Dubois fight. Should be a bit tasty, I reckon. Do us all a favour, Dubois. Fucking hell, don't let Ped Flanders beat you, bloody hell. I'll have a saucy breakdown on this fight double soon. I hope you're enjoying the pod. I know it's shit, but it's better than a kick in the cock, innit? Hurrah for now, bosh.